please. Welcome to ADB workshop series 2022, Green Road to Montreal, Planning Environmentally Sustainable Infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, a very good morning, a good afternoon, and a good evening to you, depending on what part of the world you are joining for this event. I'm Dr. Vinod Mathur, former chairperson of the National Biodiversity Authority of India, and currently working as an international consultant on green infrastructure for the Asian Development Bank. For today's event, I shall be moderating it. You are aware that infrastructure development plays a fundamental role in economic development of countries. The Asian region itself needs more than 1.7 trillion US dollars in infrastructure investment to sustain growth and quality of life in the face of urbanization and climate change. Surely there is a funding gap and as we try to plug this financing gap, we realize that uh, not only this is a challenge, but we should also consider it as an opportunity, an opportunity to drive environmentally sustainable and climate resilient economic growth in the region, which I'm afraid we were not doing so seriously some time back. So therefore it is in this context that ADB, workshop, ADB initiated a workshop series, Green Road to Montreal, early in 2022, and it focuses on government representatives, especially those involved in CPD's conference as delegates or advisors and other decision makers and stakeholders who are interested in the thematic area of green and sustainable infrastructure development. What I would like to add now is that under this workshop series, three webinars have already been conducted and my colleague Karma in a short while from now would provide an overview of the outcomes from this workshop. The fourth workshop today, which we have just begun, has been very aptly titled as Round Table of Champions. As it brings together government representatives from four important countries, Nepal, India, Philippines, and Fiji. These countries and these representatives have been spearheading the agenda of harmonizing conservation concerns in development planning in order to carve out a win-win for both environment and development. I must add that the outcomes of this workshop today would feed the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of Parties second part physical meeting, which is now going to be held in Montreal, Canada from 7th to 19th December, instead of coming in China. As you know, the main objective of the CBD COP meeting is to adopt the post-2020 global biodiversity framework recognizing that urgent policy actions are needed so that biodiversity loss can be stabilized by 2030 and we are able to be nature positive by 2050. With this, with this background, I would like to welcome you all for this event. And I would now like to invite Ms. Sujata Gupta, who is the Director for Sustainable Infrastructure Division, East Asia Department, the Asian Development Bank to give her opening remarks. So over to you, Sujata ma'am, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mathur. And uh, good, uh, a very good afternoon from Manila and a good morning, good evening, depending on where you all are. Uh, apparently there is um, an issue with the video. So, uh, Fortunately, I would say you would not be able to see me, but only hear me. And uh, I'd like to just say that it is a pleasure and a privilege for me to open this fourth and final webinar under the Green Road to Montreal 
webinar series launched by the Asian Development Bank. And uh, the purpose of this webinar series is to emphasize the importance of integrating ecologically friendly features, as well as the application of nature-based solution in, in infrastructure projects and demonstrating their multiple benefits. Now, uh, incorporating green and biodiversity friendly measures makes the projects uh, more sustainable, not only from the environmental and climate change point of view, but also from the social, financial, and economic point of view. So this all-round sustainability is actually consistent with the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment, which was endorsed uh, at the G20 Osaka summit in 2019. Now, in our uh, previous three webinars held in this series uh, on transport, energy, and coastal infrastructure, we learned about the critical role of upstream planning and the inclusion of um, social and environmental factors in making decisions on the location as well as the design of projects. So I would like to highlight two key points which came out during the sessions. One was that nature-based solutions can be embedded in infrastructure projects to deliver ecosystem services. And the second point is investing in avoidance of impacts on biodiversity is less expensive than investing in mitigation. So, you know, this is the old mantra of prevention is better than cure. So avoid rather than cure. Karma will uh, later present more details on the key takeaways from the previous session. Now, uh, today, we have four champions representing the ministries of finance and the infrastructure ministry from four of our member countries, uh, namely Fiji, India, Nepal, and the Philippines. They are practitioners on the ground responsible for making decisions on financing, designing and implementing infrastructure projects. Uh, they will share with us ongoing initiatives and challenges they face in integrating green features in their projects. We have very aptly call, uh, called our four panelists the champions because they have been spearheading the initiative of greening infrastructure projects using a range of approaches at various stages of the uh, project development. So today we will request our champions to provide their valuable feedback based on ground realities and also for the members of the audience to actively engage in discussions because our efforts on promoting the importance of green and biodiversity friendly measures and in infrastructure projects cannot just stop here. I'm also pleased to inform the audience that ADB will be organizing a side event as part of the Convention on Biodiversity Conference of Parties, uh, which will be held in Montreal in December this year. The purpose of this side event uh, will be to promote the inclusion of infrastructure in the global biodiversity framework text, showcase recent national and regional in initiatives for promoting biodiversity friendly infrastructure, and demonstrate that ecologically friendly measures make infrastructure projects more financially and economically viable, make, make the projects more sustainable. As mentioned by Dr. Mathur, over 1.7 trillion US dollars are planned to be invested annually in infrastructure in Asia alone. And we must recognize that it would be not possible to meet the 
global biodiversity framework targets of stabilizing biodiversity loss by 2030 and achieving net improvements in biodiversity by 2050. If we don't integrate green or biodiversity friendly measures in our infrastructure projects. We hope that these webinar series would have been successful to convert at least some of our participants from infrastructure and finance into biodiversity champions for promoting green infrastructure agenda. I can tell you, I am a convert and we practice this in our projects in East Asia, in our infrastructure projects. With this, I wish everyone a successful session today with rich discussions that can be carried forward to the Biodiversity COP meeting in December 2022 and in helping to prepare a roadmap for sustainable infrastructure development. With this, thank you very much for your participation today. And I hand the mic back to Dr. Martha. Thank you. Thank you, Sujata, ma'am, for your very pertinent remarks. These have set the context for our discussion today. And thanks again for highlighting that those of us who are working on financing and managing infrastructure must recognize the importance of green and biodiversity-friendly measures in the projects that they work and the role in making projects more sustainable. And when I say more sustainable, I'm looking at not only the environment and climate angle, but also from the very important social, financial, and economic point of view. And also for reiterating that this approach that we are following is also consistent with the G20 principles for quality infrastructure investment that were endorsed in the big G20 Osaka summit in 2019. So thank you, ma'am, once again, and we will take it forward from here. We move on into the program, and next is my turn to pro provide and present an overview of the kind of infrastructure development and the kind of issues that we have. And, uh, I hope you can see my presentation. Not yet, Dr. Mathur. Okay. Yes, now we can see. Okay. So what I'm going to present in the next 15 minutes or so is to give you an overview of what is meant by green infrastructure development. Although I'm fully aware that uh, the audience is uh, a mixed one, there are practitioners who are already promoting it, but it will be good to capture what in a sense we mean by green infrastructure. When we talk of infrastructure, what is the familiar story? We build roads and these roads fragment forest and habitat. They injure and kill wild animals. We create and upgrade the railway lines and ultimately they lead to killing of elephants, whether it is India, whether it is Bangladesh, this is what is our learning from there. And then we go into extractive industries of coal mining across tiger corridors and we run into great difficulty for conservation. Not only this, that we talk of road and rail, we are laying high tension lines all over in the deserts of Rajasthan and Gujarat. And these high tension lines are also killing a large number of heavy fall. So see what my take is, between the vehicle on the road and wire on the top, wildlife is getting sandwiched. Sandwiched in the real sense as we know what sandwiches are. And it is also getting slaughtered like never before. So what is the outcome? One eco, the economic is soaring. There is tremendous amount of growth everywhere. But everything ecologic is being affected. So that is where we need to be very careful that we need to care for the eco in economics and the eco in ecology. 
but I would spend a minute on looking at this typology of infrastructure development. Sometimes we are talking of blue, sometimes we are talking of green, sometimes we are talking of gray. And as we say, what is in the name or what is in the color? But yes, there is a lot. So when we talk of blue infrastructure, we are talking of rivers, lakes, ponds, wetlands, floodplains, and aquifers. Everywhere, some kind of infrastructure is being developed. And then we are doing the same thing in upland forests, mangroves, and urban farms, talking to and affecting the green infrastructure. And then there is a gray one the dams, the sea walls, the embankments, and water treatment plant. So you see our footprint is there everywhere, whether it is blue or green or gray. But what is important for me to say that it may have any color, but ultimately what we are looking is how to build a sustainable infrastructure development. I have shown here the challenges very simply put, the three L's of challenge. L for lack of awareness, L for lack of capacity, and the most important one, lack of finance. And you will see my four panelists will be highlighting that what is the constraint they're feeling in the ground. But what is important is that we need to move away. Away from what? A silo or a solo approach. And move towards the strategic approach. And that is where organizations like ADB come into play, that when countries develop their plans, we need to look at them very strategically. Undoubtedly, there is an inadequate understanding. People don't understand what natural capital is. ADB has a big project on natural capital, very useful. But the man on the street needs to understand why we need to protect and conserve the natural capital. What are green spaces? What are wildlife corridors and connectivity? And what is their linkage with human well-being? As a practitioner of biodiversity for the last four decades, that is what my take is, that unless people connect things to their own well-being, they are not ready to take action. So we need to demonstrate that there is a very strong connect between maintenance of natural capital, preservation of green spaces, maintaining corridors and connectivity over there. But where is the capacity? It is very easily said that uh, uh, we need to do this, we need to do that, but capacity are invariably missing or they are inadequate. And we need capacities to plan, to design, to construct, and most importantly, to monitor. As our colleagues from four countries will say that what excellent work they are doing in planning and designing, even constructing, but monitoring will remain a very important issue if we are to look in long term. And then, as I mentioned earlier, lack of finance and the kind of finance solutions that we have. These solutions have to be innovative. You can't ask governments and other agencies to pump in money. If we want transformative actions, we need to find innovative finance solutions. So ultimately, let me spend a minute. What is the answer to all this? The answer is in the word or the term mainstreaming. Mainstreaming, as you can see, is best understood as an attempt of modifying the larger development strategies by incorporating biodiversity goals for both development and conservation. And I want to reach out both my communities, the development community and the conservation community, that we need to come together. Then only we can have this uh, dream of development without destruction. There can be no development, there should be no development by destroying anything. And then moving one step further, can we do a development with design? And that is where, again, institutions like ADB come into play that can we invest, can we look, can we look at design features? And as you will see in the case studies that will be presented, how design can help achieving the twin objectives. And today's infrastructure development 
must conform to the goals and targets being approved in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which as Sujata mentioned, that this framework is now being negotiated. And there is a very important uh, component, what is called as connectivity conservation. Because one thing which infrastructure does is to break or to impair the connectivity. And therefore, the approach that we are now talking of is has to be animal friendly, the wild animal friendly that I am talking. We need to provide pathways for movement of species. And I have no hesitation in saying that the green has to be prefixed with smart. So what we need, we need smart infrastructure, we need green infrastructure, and this infrastructure should lead to promote smart growth and smart conservation. Any dialogue with our decision makers and politicians, which does not cater to growth, is not going to be accepted. So therefore, we need to convince that this green infrastructure that we are now talking will promote growth as well as conservation. There are some basic principles I want to briefly mention over there, because uh, sometimes we do not understand the science behind the conservation. So context is important. What you can do in the United States, you cannot do in major part of Asia. And even within Asia, what you can do in India, you cannot do in Bangladesh and vice versa. And within our own country, which is so big, what we can do in one or two states, we cannot do across. So therefore, context is important. But what is the learning? Our measures should be grounded in science. Then only people will accept that. An evidence-based science using modern technology, we need to look at the principles of land use theory and practice. And therefore, all the smart green infrastructure that we are talking has to be planned and implemented both before we take up construction, during the construction phase, during the monitoring phase over there. And finally, this question of who pays for it? Well, the banks are there to loan money, but who is the taker and how these loans are to be returned? So this is the big question. And I'm sure our four panelists are going to respond to that, that what the proponents can do, what the regulators can do, what the donors can do. So these are some of the very fundamental questions which will be answered by my colleagues today. And that is the purpose of this workshop today, that we hear from our country representatives to whom, as Sujata mentioned, these are the champions. These are the people who are at the forefront. And with this background, I, I will stop here and I will encourage all our practitioners and proponents and panel discussions and the audience to stay and listen to what we have to say. So I will stop here and uh, would now request uh, my colleague uh, Karma, who has been spearheading this webinar series. As you heard, this is the fourth and final workshop of the series. The earlier three ones have been had uh, from uh, January onwards uh, in, for greening transport, for energy. There are a lot of key messages which have to be learned from there. And I will hand over to Karma to take it forward. So over to you, Karma, now. Hello, can you hear me, Dr. Mathur? Loud and clear. Okay, because I kind of lost my <laughs> unmute button. No, um, no, we can. Please go ahead. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Mathur, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to share the key messages and takeaways from the previous three sessions. And uh, I had the pleasure of listening to the recording of the previous three sessions, and uh, there's a lot of good information in there. But I had the difficult task of um, distilling the key messages, as there was a lot of you know important messages. So I have uh, summarized it into these uh, seven key points, which I will explain one by one. So. Um, 
And of course, all of the material that I'm presenting, uh, the text as, uh, as well as some of the figures, the graphs, the pictures have all been taken from presentations from our speakers in the previous three sessions. So the first um, main message that came out of the sessions is, is on the point why on why sh should we care about biodiversity? And one of our speakers had presented this slide with this figure, uh, which is taken from the annual report of the World Economic Forum, and it shows the top 10 risks that the planet faces. And you can see uh, one, two, three, climate, extreme weather, and biodiversity. So uh, it's very clear that biodiversity is important for the planet, for humanity, for survival. And that's why it matters. The second key message is that there is a huge uh, push for growth of infrastructure globally. And we already heard this figure that in Asia and the Pacific, uh, there's going to be investments of about $1.7 trillion per year in infrastructure. And uh, so this is huge. And in this context, we are talking about infrastructure uh, all kinds of infrastructure, transport, energy, coastal, agriculture. Uh, however, another key message which came out very loud and clear is the importance of the energy infrastructure, particularly on the part where we are rapidly scaling up renewable energy. Uh, and this is particularly in light of the climate target of um, maintaining 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperature and all the countries uh, submitting their NDCs and uh, commitments uh, under the Paris Agreement. So there is a massive uh, rush and push to moving towards renewable energy. And uh, you can just see the figures here. It's going to be a lot of money invested in this. And Asia and the Pacific region has a large role to play. So about 42% of investments will be made in Asia for, for renewable energy. And then you can see that uh, within 2021, uh, between 2021 and 2026, uh, there's going to be uh, an expected 70% growth in renewable energy. And most of this is going to be solar and wind. Now, this is something that we need to be very careful about because both of these energy sources, though clean, are very space intensive. And you can see in the white box on the right side of the screen. And this is just illustrating the, the land needs. So land area needed to power one flat screen TV. And you can see if it's a wind farm, uh, the area needed to generate that energy is 37 square meter. For solar, it's 14 square meter. For coal-fired power plant, it's 0.8 meter. So you can see the wind and solar needs much more space uh, in comparison to the, the conventional uh, old uh, forms of energy generation. And together with that, there will be a need for more than doubling of the power lines uh, in order to evacuate uh, energy from the new wind and solar plants. So this is a very important fact that we have to keep in mind. And uh, the other uh, challenging issue is that currently the information on the impacts of uh, energy projects on biodiversity uh, and particularly uh, on impacts of power lines on migratory birds in the region is, is highly limited. And one of our speakers had presented that amongst all the data available globally, there's only 6.1% of the data comes from Asia. So we need to do a better job in collecting data and understanding what kind of impacts uh, these power lines and energy projects are uh, creating. Um, so, and this is a key message, another key message which came out from several of our speakers in the energy session is that if we get it wrong, we can potentially have worse impacts and we could be in a worse situation than where we are today. Because, um, uh, and renewable energy is not automatically green. Just because you're getting your uh, electricity from a solar plant or a wind farm does not mean that it is uh, renewable. Uh, I mean, sorry, it does not mean that it is green. 
because there are a lot of social and environmental issues, you know, uh, associated with uh, developing and operating these kind of, uh, of plants. And um, here are two figures on the screen, uh, again, presented by our speaker from uh, Irina. And she showed that um, there's going to be uh, an increased generation in waste from the solar PVs. And you can see it's expected that about 212 uh, metric tons uh, of this waste will be generated by 2050. And then, of course, uh, in relation to the battery that will be needed for electrification, electric cars, you know, all kinds of electrification, there is a need for rare uh, metals. And you can see the need um, in comparison between 2020 and 2030, it increases substantially from less than two metric tons to about 13 metric tons by 2030. And extraction of these rare, rare metals, most of which happen in the developing world, including Asia and the Pacific, comes with a lot of environmental and social risks. So there are a lot of risks, and we need to be mindful about all of these. And of course, there is the huge risk to biodiversity. And poor siting of renewable energy projects could destroy 11 million hectares of natural land globally, including 3 million of key biodiversity areas. And it can uh, provide risk to uh, 1,500 threatened species. And this, in turn, could result in the release of over 400 million tons of stored carbon. So this will then again sort of undo our work in trying to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And um, one um, example is the sad story of the great Indian bustard, which is on its way to uh, extinction. And the main reason for this bird going becoming ex uh, or being on its way to extinction is that uh, there are a lot of collisions with power lines. And um, there is this estimate, which was um, based on a study by the Wildlife Institute of India, that there are 18 collisions per year, and the population of this bird is less than 100. So there can be a lot of catastrophic uh, impacts if we are you know, similar to this, and we hope that the story will change uh, with the other birds as we uh, get more uh, information and become better in, in designing and locating our projects. So upstream planning is critical. So this is very clear. And uh, one of our speakers had mentioned, uh, the speaker who spoke on hydropower dams, is that the most important step is location, location, location. And this is not only for hydropower dam, I think it's for all kinds of infrastructure. We really need to uh, look at things from the strategic point of view and uh, strategic environmental assessments need to be put into practice more often including alternative analysis, trying to you know, have different uh, locations of, of the infrastructure as well as different design options. And uh, one of our speakers had uh, presented this multi-criteria analysis um, to understand the economic uh, implications you know, as part of the alternative analysis. And um, as what Sujata had mentioned earlier, avoidance is key. Avoidance is much cheaper than investing in mitigation, and we should opt for mitigation only after we have thoroughly explored the avoidance option. And the good news is that there are several tools out there, and what I have listed here on the screen is just a few which I got from the sessions, but there are many more tools. And uh, most important is the AviStep tool, which was um, jointly developed by, uh, by ADB and BirdLife International. And this tool is critical, particularly for all the new uh, solar and wind, uh, wind power projects, where it helps to uh, identify locations that are least ecologically sensitive, but also have uh, lots of uh, wind and solar uh, resources. Uh, and currently, the sensitivity maps are available for these four countries, India, Nepal, Thailand, Vietnam. And I understand that the, they are working on further increasing the maps to uh, many other countries within the region. And then, of course, there is the IBAT tool, the Bilby modeling tool. Uh, we had a presenter from CICERO, which is the scientific technical arm of the National Government of Australia. And they have this tool, which is able to carry out um, cumulative impact assessment, and also do uh, alternative analysis, looking at assemblage of species. Uh, and there is also the drift method, uh, particularly for uh, 
basin-wide assessments for hydropower projects. So there are a lot of tools and options available to help us with upstream planning. And the other message from our speakers we got is that we do know how to embed uh, nature-based solutions in infrastructure projects. And we heard some excellent examples from our uh, speaker um, uh, in about Kushan City. This is a city in China and where they have found ways to integrate uh, within the transport, the road corridors, ways to have the water management system to help to both manage the, the water pollution as well as uh, storing water. So there were some great examples. And we also had great examples uh, on the transport projects uh, from our speaker, Norris Dodd. And these were some other examples from our speakers in the coastal event on um, the restorations happening within the coastal uh, ecosystems. So we, we, there is a lot of information and we are already doing a lot. We just need to um, scale it up. And uh, most important message is that biodiversity brings economic benefits. And there is, uh, we got a lot of uh, data from our speakers in the three sessions. Uh, and uh, from the session in coastal infrastructure, we learned that uh, coral reef and mangroves help to reduce wave energy and height. And there are huge savings. Uh, so I will not read out all the numbers one by one, but you can see for yourself, there is a lot of savings uh, in terms of uh, protected um, protection to damages if there are storms. Um, and there's also a lot of... Uh, uh, people, 15 million people that could be, you know, saved by uh, protecting mangroves. Um, and also in terms of the, the two boxes in the pink below, this is with the transport infrastructure, that the benefits from mitigation, uh, mitigation measures to reduce vehicle wildlife collision can exceed project costs in five to 10 years. And it's always better to be proactive then reactive in terms of uh, generating, you know, the, the ecosystem service value. And you can see the numbers there. You have almost uh, uh, triple the value if you take a proactive approach than a reactive approach. And we had some excellent examples from our speaker, uh, Kim Bonin from the Conservation Strategy Fund. And uh, again, a lot of uh, case studies here. I will not uh, read them in detail, but you can see the numbers for yourself on how uh, the first case is the Amazon Basin where they studied all these roads and they found that by selecting those roads, which are most economically efficient, but least environmentally destructive, could avoid 90% of environmental damage or economic losses of more than 7.6 billion. And there's also a huge area of forest that can be saved. And uh, Myanmar, so again, it's also got to do with, um, with the valuation of biodiversity. I know this is an area which is challenging. And in ADB, we are trying to uh, have uh, more, uh, we are trying to have better accounting for value of biodiversity and natural capital. So here, uh, the key message in the case of Myanmar is that just because there is no price tag to something, it does not mean that there is no value. So here you can also see the difference uh, in the value once you consider all the ecosystem services. And uh, the last case study was a project in Uganda, which was very interesting on how they found that it was much, it was going to be much cheaper and um, the financial gains were going to be much better if they uh, selected the road outside the Bundi National Park rather than inside it, because if they build the road inside the park, it would, um, it would, uh, you know, reduce. It would have negative impacts on the gorilla population and therefore negatively impact the the tourism. So these are all great examples which show that biodiversity brings economic benefits. And uh, so the last message was that there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, despite all those challenges, there are a lot of opportunities and uh, most important is with regard to wind and solar farms that it is possible to readily integrate them into landscapes with low ecological value, but high uh, availability of sunshine and wind. And an example was that in India, where there is a huge rush to shift to solar and wind farm, uh, solar and wind energy, that the available uh, degraded land is 12 times more than what is actually needed 
So there is a lot of potential. And then you have your every step tool right there, which uh, you can use. And there are organizations such as the uh, Energy Task Force, the ETF, which has been, uh, which is being led by the CMS, the Convention on uh, Migration of Species. Um, and this is a platform for which uh, they help uh, the member countries to exchange information on best practices on, on energy projects. And then you have the IBAT tool, the BILB tool, what I mentioned before, and there are various other tools. And there's also uh, in, in the financing, Dr. Mathur mentioned that financing is critical. So there is a lot of innovative um, measures being taken. Uh, also insurance, we heard from our speaker, Josh Ling, uh, one of our ADB colleagues on how there are initiatives to have coral uh, coral reef finance and insurance, uh, particularly in the in the Pacific countries, and where this helps to uh, mobilize resources quickly to maintain the coastal ecosystems as well as uh, address and uh, you know repair the damages during times of extreme weather events. And there's also a gradual increase in the availability of blue bonds, trust funds, and blue carbon markets. So there are a lot of opportunities out there, and these are just a few that I'm naming. There are many more uh, opportunities. Uh, lastly, again, back to the main uh, seven takeaways. Um, so biodiversity is important. It's amongst the top five biggest threat to the planet. We are going to have huge infrastructure growth and uh, we are, these are expected uh, 2030 and until 2050. So um, this could bring a lot of uh, negative impacts on biodiversity, but also a lot of opportunities, you know, in particularly with regard to financing. And renewable energy is not automatically green. We really have to understand that. Upstream planning is critical and we do have a lot of tools to help us with it. And uh, we already have a lot of experience in embedding nature-based solutions in infrastructure projects. Biodiversity has economic value, and we have a lot of opportunities to have both infrastructure growth and biodiversity gain at the same time, uh, similar to what Dr. Mathur had mentioned. And the last point, which was uh, mentioned by a speaker um, from uh, CISRO, the o Oceans Program, was that the key thing is that we need all the stakeholders to sit together on the same table and speak the same language. So the information is all out there. And as Dr. Men Dr. Mathur had mentioned, we are currently a bit in silo. So we need to move from a siloed approach to a strategic approach where we talk to each other and share information. So with that, I will stop here. And I uh, will hand over the floor back to Dr. Mathur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karma, for that excellent update uh, from the three earlier webinars that we had uh, since beginning of the year. I want to assure our audience that uh, all these learnings uh, from these webinars and including the fourth one today, ADB has plans to bring uh, a publication which will very briefly summarize uh, what are the key takeaways. And we understand that our decision makers, our planners who don't have much time to read long text will have a, a shorter document of say five to 10 pages where they can see that uh, what these learnings are and what can we do with these learnings. My suggestion is that these learnings have to be integrated into action while planning, while designing, while implementing sustainable infrastructure development. So hold on for a while till we finish this workshop and come back with a, with a document which will have learnings and takeaways for the various stakeholders. And now we move on to the second part of our event today, which is uh, requesting our four government panelists as they've been described as champions for providing some updates on the actions and activities undertaken by them in their respective countries while planning and promoting sustainable infrastructure development. The point is that nobody is waiting for anybody. Countries are going ahead and that is what you will get the flavor when these four presentations are made that countries, whether big or small, Philippines, Fiji, uh, Nepal and India are moving ahead. We have requested each of our champion 
that within a span of about 15 minutes, they should provide an update on the policies and practices relating to sustainable infrastructure development, because somewhere national development plans have been made, somewhere guidelines have been made, somewhere eco-friendly uh, guidance documents are available. And based on that, uh, uh, share with us some examples of projects where these have been designed and implemented, because that will give us a flavor. And the first on my list is uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Sushil Babu Dhakal, the project director of the ADB, Department of Roads in Nepal. And I will request Mr. Dakal to kindly come up with his presentation, highlighting this. And please be very concerned with the time, not more than 15 minutes. So over to you, Mr. Dakal. The floor is yours. Your time begins now. Thank you. You are muted. Mr. Dakal, you have to be unmuted. We can't hear you, Mr. Dakar. Um, is maybe some technical problem? Sir, are you able to speak? Yeah. But your voice is very far. We can't really hear you properly. Uh, and your screen, I think it has to switch to the presentation. Uh, Dr. Mathur, maybe we can uh, have Mr. Mukupadai, maybe while who while uh, Mr. Sushil Babu figures out. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, Dr. Mukupadai, are you ready? Can you come in now? Yes, sir, I am ready. I'm Please ready. come in. Yes. Thank you. So, Mr. Dakar, please wait now till we sort it out. What is the issue? And Dr. Mukhopadhyay, please maintain the time limits. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My screen is displaying. Yeah, it is coming. But put it in slide mode. Yes, already yeah. put in. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Mathu and ADB. They give me opportunity on behalf of India because we are the big player on behalf of Ministry of Road Transport and Highways for implementing for the need of the people as well as the economy of the country. Just we are not building the road, we are building the nation. Kindly see that what are the mandate of our ministry? Because we are a implementing agency on the behalf of Ministry of Road Transport Highways. Not only construct the road, we are giving the consultation, we are giving the advice to the government as well as the finance people, including the cabinet, what kind of infrastructure, what kind of road has to be developed to connect. And not only including the road, we are right now, we have started for the most eco-friendly infrastructure is the ropeway. 
so this is the total length of the road length in our country that is 62 lakh out of which that national high is 141 lakh uh, 1 lakh 41000 and where it is only 2% of the entire road length however the entire traffic is to be gathered by these 2% of the road out of this 85% passenger and 70% is the freight traffic. Because already we have uh, mentioned that on Biawa Ministry of Road Transport Highways, there are several implementing agencies like NHI, NHI DCL, BRO, NHPWD. These are the major players. Out of them, NHI has a big mandate for the development. Already NHI successfully completed that is 71,310 kilometer road. It is either two lane or two lane paved shoulder, four lane, four lane paved shoulder, six lane and above. That is eight lane, including the port connectivity as well as coastal connectivity. Now, question is that this infra goes build not only that it is increasing the GDP. That is the major issue because even though this pandemic COVID, when the entire country entire uh, world is in a silence but nhi go ahead they have nhi has not never stopped for any activity even though pandemic during 2019 20 including the part of 21 so that that this bharat mala has been conceived during 2017 and we can able to successfully already progress is going on it is a very good tweet and we can able to construct. So that is 8,000 crore, that is 50% of the investment from the forest investor. So this is a very, very good opportunity for investing the economy and for the road building. That, that is uh, with the increase of the economy, that economy of the people, that is social people, because whatever our three these are already mentioned there are the green infrastructure definitely it is essential but simultaneously not my submission all the honorable audience as well as uh, the uh, participant it is not only design stage because it has to be start from the planning stage because we have to plan the road and connectivity in such a manner Holistically, it will the increase not only the increase in economy, also increase in biodiversity. Also, now the what is the scenario of entire? Because whatever as per the COP mandate that is 2030, we are going to planning the neutral carbon road. Because that type of policy is guidelines. Right now, we have a dedicated you know, body which is called. Uh, road Congress, we, IRC, Indian Road Congress, we have a dedicated R&D, CRRI, we have a dedicated engineering learning platform that is Indian economy of higher engineer, where we are giving the training and learning to all the entire country. So the major part of this carbon footprint, especially for the road sector, whatever, 14%, out of them, that is for the planning, design, and construction is around 10 to 12 percent, and rest of this completely depends on the operational stage. Now, operation is uh, the operation. What is the key part, uh, factors of the operation? Operation it depends on the engine quality and fuel quality. That part has to be considered. That is now the question is the how we can develop our national highs. National highs can be developed in the major two categories. One, whatever the existing infrastructure that has to be improved with some bypasses, whatever the black spots are there, what are the cars, hard curve are there, where the hairpin bends are there, that has to be improved. And another is the green field. So for this bound field, there is a lack of options. But whatever our uh, Mrs. Gupta has mentioned, avoidance, that is, uh, I am I agree with her, that is avoidance, because when we are going to planning, even the Bharat Mala, whatever, 64,000 kilometers, when we are planning any road to connecting, 
So always we plan in such a manner where there should be the lean forest cover, where there is a lean protected area, where there is a least impact on the water body, least impact on the coastal, and not only even the least impact of the social structure, including the archaeological structure. So this is the planning stage, is the most important and most important tool for what, how much green will be that infrastructure. Design is the secondary, that is planning is the most important thing when we are designing any road. Now, the, already I mentioned that is we are going to innovate. By, by, by innovation, we can successfully complete it 530 kilometers with the plastic soil. That is, we are using the garbage, the but segregation. Now, question is that we there is a challenge how we can uh, collect those plastic. That is the mode. Then the sustainable, that the road is made green, that it should be carbon neutral by 2030 and sustainable exploration. <coughs> that the employment of one lakh people for the next 10 years. Now, question is what kind of benefits are available? Reduction in emissions. As soon as you see, when you are connecting Delhi to Mumbai, at present it is distance is 1900 kilometer. Now we design a road from uh, Sona to Mumbai, which is length is 1300 kilometers. Step forward, we have able to reduce 600 kilometer. Now we see how much natural resources has been saved by any GI, not for us as well as for the future. For this, and not only that, whatever the existing infrastructure of the NHA connecting from um, uh, Delhi to Mumbai, that is already overcrowded. And there is no further provision for expanding 10 lane or 12 lane. But traffic is at around more than 200, 2, 2 lakhs to few passenger car units. Now, reduction in consumption time, that is as on today, this time from Delhi to Mumbai is requiring almost 36 hours. But as soon as road will come, we can reach from Delhi to Mumbai by 14 hours. Utilization of alternate material like fire, industrial waste, industrial gang, and slag. Then the generation of solar power. That is, whenever the toll operations are going on, successfully we are not not only we are using those uh, renewable energy even the energy we are uh, providing to the nearest grid to the transmission line then the rainwater harvesting that is rainwater harvesting structure i don't know whether it is not well and perfectly put whatever is the area it depends on the groundwater table. If the groundwater table is uh, less than 10 meter or 12 meter, because the structure itself is a 6 meter height. So if where is around the Ganga basin, where the water table is 4 meter or 5 meter or 3 meter. So in that area, if we put such kind of structure, it will contaminate the groundwater. <coughs> that Area should be very, very specific. The re recharging structure, recharging structure is not advisable or we are not designing everywhere where is groundwater table is shallow. <coughs> then the green well development, because in the expressway we are acquiring 90 meter out of this, but road can be constructed within 35, 36 meter. Either we are putting wider media or on the either side of the carriageway for a green belt. Then generation of employment. So these are the things, <coughs> the benefit which can be, not only we will create the infrastructure and connectivity. So regarding this, go for planning. <coughs> this is the planning. Not only we are considering the engineering aspect, do we are considering the social environment, we are considering the physical environment, we are considering the biological environment, we are considering the natural environment. So, 
when we are designing any road we are considering holistically all these five parameters during planning stage that is the main issue when we are involving any <coughs> brown field or ground field now the score matrix will tell how much greener that infrastructure if it is less than 120 that is low 120 is 100 it is a medium and this way we are making the index and then we are going for alternative study which which option is the best option i am not going to detail any then we are providing this type of carbon sink that is corridor along the road but this type of greener development can be done after the construction that is completion of the construction means construction time maybe one year six months two two years six months right now we are able to complete not less than three years <coughs> everywhere and already by this time we have a very good guideline because whatever madam has mentioned that is policies we have a several policies and guidelines not only on the engineering aspect and the raw material we have a guideline how to plant the road we have a guideline how to how to develop the proper passage and corridor we have a guideline how to use the flyers how to use the plastic how to use the renewable energy all these guidelines already <laughs> developed very successfully not only the row that is the main constant because there is the two types of impact one is the reversible another is the irreversible now irreversible cannot be gained to the original scenario <coughs> that reversible can be attained within 5 years 10 years or 20 years that the original scenario or we can mitigate but in the road infrastructure only the constant is the irreversible where the in thermodynamics uh, language it is can is a del g that is that is the positive that is re reaction will go in forward direction means all the development will go in the forward where will be the least that is the del g negative now this is the uniform scenario of the road building so we have a very large number of successful stories when NHI has been started 2019-95 and then we could successfully completed golden quadrilateral north south corridor and east west corridor and after 2013 and so on we have done going for when we are jumping for the green field then the eastern peripheral expresses by the developing this expressway ultimately we can able to not only reduce the road length we can reduce the huge quantity of air pollution in Delhi because now no heavy vehicle right now may come within the city of Delhi. So similar type of which is you can say a outer ring road. Now NHI is planning in the every major capital of our country for the outer or peripheral ring road so that large and high more, more excel vehicle should not come within the city limit. So all the emission and whatever may be, it can be drastically reduced. Similarly, Dr. Mukhubadhyay, Dr. Mukhubadhyay, please keep moving. Five minutes for you. You have a lot of ground to cover. Please cover. Continue. So these are the very good examples. Normoda Bridge where we are not put any tears on the Chambol, even though that is Chambol Gharial in Normada, then Ganga, that is Vivekananda Shitu, we have not put any tears on the river bed, so there is no water afflux, which, which, is, which will not increase any flat plain, or which will not inter interfere on the aquatic system, even though water flow also. Kenani Nasari Channel, so it is not only reducing the length, it is entirely the top of that. By this, around 42 kilometer length of ROW 25 meter, 
it is by the positive impact the entire landscape is now free for the wildlife animals so these type of so many number of structures we have put in, in entire country including the banial sinagar banial delhi katra delhi mumbai corridor so these are the plantation already we have a sets of guidelines including our ministry nitin gadkari under the chairmanship of nitin gadkari sir we have formulated 2015 green eye plantation and that is another thing madam has mentioned that is reduction that instead of killing we are going for transplantation so this is the energy conservation that from that single toll we are able to generate 400 kilowatt and we are using less than 2 kilowatt and surplus energy we are providing to near our grid so these are the waste material how we are using during using we are going for continuous water sprinkling and so on so that there will be no dust erosion so this is the rain water harvesting structure already i mentioned then the deep irrigation because instead of using the fresh water we are going for deep irrigation for the plantation in median and deep now the big challenge that is already at that time sir was the director wii under his chairmanship this elevated corridor has been constructed it is a combined structure not only for the elevated part adjoining that structure <coughs> there is a railway line and there is another passage so ultimately 731 meter combined structure now it is entire land is free from our road scenario this is the underpass around national pench that is the nh7 right now it is nh44 in maharashtra this is the already how how the animals are using every day they are putting camera there is a monitoring is going on to wi ntc so each and every day number of species is increasing and their population is increasing for utilizing all these structures so this is another this is the elevated structure in maharashtra that pench national park that is around 37 km in the state of maharashtra and 16 km in the state of madhya pradesh the entire corridor entire landscape we are able to protect these are the elevated structure in the state of madhya pradesh for animals and they are using every day they are using all these these are the sound and noise barrier not only we are putting because these all these animals are movement are in the uh, deep night at the early morning so the anti light glaring and anti sound because when we are putting this type of pier we are putting some joker so that there will be the shock as well so layer vibration on the surface so these are the elevated structures we are already proposing in the ranasambhur tiger reserve kindly see elevated corridor and underpasses in in uh, outside the tiger buffer and not only that we are choosing the alignment after six options not one to three it is a six option ultimately we are able to do this is the one major one new technology has been developed by nhei that is called cart and cover which is a like a pseudo tunnel like that because whatever the private land we are acquiring for the road development now the entire top of that land will be used by the wildlife this is all called cart and cover where 3 to 4 meter underneath and 2 meter because vertical clearance should be the 5.5 meter for the clearance and this is the structure when the our alignment passing through the national chambal sanctuary kindly see how major this is a cable type of bridge we are putting infrastructure so that there will be no water obstruction even though in the flat plain we are putting 60 meter span and including the large number of structures so that there will be bare minimum impact on the ecology of entire alignment this is the structure then the subsequent section of this delhi mumbai express way passing through the mukundra tiger hill where we are putting 4.8 uh, dr mukopadhyay please come to your conclusion 
we are running out of time last slide please your conclusion this is the last we are doing the delhi dehradun section and it will be the biggest structure implementation is going on that is there are no 12 km long elevated corridor and it will be the biggest in the asia also this this will be the schematic diagram we are putting where there is no vegetation on the river bed we are putting the piers on the single pier some are double pier and this is the tunnel so these are the all guidelines we have already we mentioned these are the water body not only we are developing the uh, road we are developing the water bodies in around the road uh, by this uh, 75th amrit sarovar we are planned to 50000 this type of water body will be created in our country so these are the how we are controlling the erosion how we are controlling the river bank so these are the solar panels now in conclusion that is not a partnership of scientific <coughs> institution or statutory body in conducted the underpasses overpasses eco duct elevated corridor via duct all these kind of combination of structure that is site specific and city specific when there is a fast we are going to avoid if there is no question no there is no chances no visible alignments are there so then we are putting all kinds of structure then we are put uh, designing the road like this way the important we can say the structure means the use by all the species 24 hours and 7 days 365 days in a year so this is the not only saving the fuel it is enhance the economy of the country use of waste plastic already mentioned reduction in travel time creation of huge carbon sink because on the road side already we have going to plan uh, more than 3 crore and uh, apart from the statutory whatever the funds has been deposited with the from ad hoc campa fund that is 75 years already 50000 this type of water body we have a 100% subsidy we are uh, already created by our honorable prime minister nhl ml one organization where we are going to implement 200 ropeways entire country and 34 multimodal logistic parks the scenario development being nhi not only scientific organization it is including ngo ngi self help group all stakeholder we have been considered so thank you given me opportunity maybe one or two minutes extremely sorry for that thank you thank you dr mukopadhyay can we go back to mr dhakal please mr dhakal has has the tissue been sorted yes yes uh, i think i yes, already please go ahead. now now we can see you here you please go ahead okay it is uh, is it an uh, presentation or yeah uh, uh, no sir i think you have to switch we can see your next slide okay uh, good morning good afternoon everybody uh, i am sushil babu dakal uh, from nepal and uh, uh, you know i am today i am going to uh, present on the topic of addressing biodiversity and ecosystem services in road projects finance uh, by ftb in nepal yes so please. sorry can you please switch your display setting what we see is the smaller screen not the presentation mode screen if you click on top go to display i think there is an option to switch okay this currently we can see both your first and second slide yeah here yeah, display settings display okay. settings display setting Let on me... top sir on top of the slide yes okay mm -hmm. okay i think it's okay then sir please because we are losing time uh okay let me try a uh, height presenter view huh? mm uh stop the view 
and now you go to slide mode from current slide. Ah, uh, okay. At the top. Ah, uh, okay. From here also. Okay, I am. I am waiting. Yeah, not seen here. It will come. Uh, it's not showing, sir. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I am not looking at my screen. Yeah, we cannot see either. We just see a dark screen. Okay, let me try again. Uh, this is my presentation. And yes, and then click at the bottom. Hi, right, Karma. Shinki can help. She has the presentation ready. Okay, uh, sir, uh, Chinky, our colleague will share the screen, will share your slides. Okay, okay Chinky, can you please share? Yes. Hello, let me start, please. Yeah, please. It's showing already my sli the slide. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. It's showing. It's okay, you can just go need to go ahead. If okay, we... okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start my presentation. My presentation topic is addressing biodiversity and ecosystem services in road projects financed by ADB in Nepal. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, let me highlight the Nepal's biodiversity. Nepal has a 49th position in the world's biodiversity. Uh, you know, the uh, species uh, diversity in Nepal is, is because of the change in the gradient from the 60 meter uh, from the mean sea level to the highest peak in the, uh, the Mount Everest in Nepal. You know, there are over 22,000 species reported from Nepal. That is 1.3% of global biodiversity. In the richness of flowering plant species, the country holds 27th position in the old and 10th position in Asia. Next slide, please. Let me highlight some policies on biodiversity and the wildlife conservation. Uh, you know, the Constitution of Nepal 2015, the National Park and Wildlife Conservation Act of 1973, uh, you know, the uh, Soil Conservation and Watershed Management Act of 1982, Forest Act of 1993, Environmental Protection Act 1995, National Park and Wildlife Conservation Regulation 1994. And these are the policies, you know, that recently the Nepal government has, uh, you know, endorsed the Wildlife Friendly Infrastructure Construction Directive 2022. Can you please, next slide. Uh, yeah, let me highlight some, you know, the policies under the Wildlife Friendly uh, Infrastructure Construction Directive 2022. You know, the major working policies you know, the corridors will be uh, defined for the infrastructure passing through the forest for your kind information. information. The recent data shows that about 37% of the land in Nepal are covered with forest. So this is the most relevant working policy and the coordination and the cooperation will be ensured for the development of the conservation friendly infrastructure. You know, the by nature, the linear infrastructure uh, shall expand from on geological uh, geographical location to the other. So we have to uh, consult OAK with the number of stakeholders. So coordination and cooperation is the best working policy. Also the human uh, wildlife conflict shall be minimized and the, uh, the you know, the directive engages the policy uh, to work through the awareness program. And you know, by engineering will be the integral part of the development OAKs. This is the working policy for your kind information. We are one of the pioneers in bioengineering. You know, we have already adopted the integration of the bioengineering with the infra road infrastructure since the decade of 90. Uh, can you please next slide? Okay, let me highlight some important provisions under the directives. Uh, you know, the formulation of the plan. You know, uh, during the planning phase, we have to try to, to you know, align the infrastructure uh, you know, outside the sensitive areas and the very sensitive areas. Uh, in, in parallel, you know, we have to carry out the detailed technical study, uh, detailed engineering design, and the studies like, you know, the uh, environment study, uh, IEA, EIA, and the social impact assessment, etc. And the next important provision in the directory is that 
you know, we have to construct the wildlife friendly structures like, you know, the overpasses, underpasses, a guiding fence, noise resistant structures as recommended by the IEA and EIA reports. And the important provisions on the, in the direct, uh, directive is that, you know, wild fauna and the flora species listed in the pro protected list uh, according to the existing law to be protected. And, you know, uh, there, there is a very important uh, provision on, uh, in, in the directives, you know, the determination of the national infrastructure corridor. Uh, you know, uh, our, our committee has been provisioned, you know, consisting of the uh, six members, and uh, this committee is led by the Secretary of Ministry of uh, Forest and Environment, and this committee will define the infrastructure corridor, and this committee will solve the every problems. Can you please the next slide? Uh, let me start, uh, you know, let me, let me, you know, highlight the, uh, you know, initiatives uh, in Nepal, uh, especially systematic initiative uh, uh, from the Naranakar Butol Road. Uh, this is 113 kilometer long road stretch uh, from the East West Highway, which is the longest East West Highway in the, in Nepal, which is 1027 kilometer long. And from this highway, we have started the bio, bio baseline biodiversity assessment very systematically. Yes, we have already constructed a number of bio, you know, wildlife friendly structures, but there was not systematic uh, process was followed. On the, you, know, you can see in the, in the screen, the number of the, some photographs uh, from the camera traps. On the basis of the field visit and the camera trap survey, uh, construction support is a consultant, uh, their, their wildlife expert and the individual, uh, you know, ecologist, Mr. Norris Dutt, has finalized the biodiversity assessment report for this project. Can you please, next slide. And you can see in the screen the alignment of the Naran Ghat Budol Road. In the screen, you can see the rectangular, uh, you know, figures. This indicates the forest patches. In this particular road, there are uh, 11 forest patches and the throw, uh, these are the uh, potential, you know, habitat for the wildlife. And, you know, uh, in the Narankara Butol roads, uh, you know, there are 115 numbers of the cross tender structures which, which can potentially use by the wildlife uh, because of their size. But after the study, it is found that only 35 number, uh, you know, structures uh, will be used by the wildlife. Uh, you know, and after the study, it is found that the 12 numbers of the structures are to be uh, revised because of their size. And after the BBA report, the original design of these 12 number of structures are uh, modified. Uh, next slide, please, please. Previous one, please. Yeah, uh, let, let me share the cost implication because of the change in design on this 12 number of structures. Yeah, uh, as for the initial, uh, you know, contract price, uh, the uh, cost for this 12 cross to the structure was 1.1 million US dollar. After design modification, the cost increased to 1.93 million US dollar, and there is only 0.82 million uh, dollar increase in the cost. And that is only 0.65 percent of original contract amount. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, let me see the fact and lesson learned from, from this BBA study uh, in the Naran Karabutu rule. Uh, actually, there are 409 number of cross tender structures in the Naran Karabutu road. Out of them, only 35 structures are being used by the uh, wildlife substantially. That means that, you know, the 35 number of structures, if we have, you know, uh, make the you know root survey at the at the stage of planning. Then this structure could have been designed, uh, you know, before before in 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 the construction phase, and uh, the uh, design may 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 be suitable for the cross drainage as well as for the wildlife. Uh, number two, the most of the cross drainage structures allows uh, the wildlife movement if they are uh, adequate size. That is why while designing uh, the cross the structure, we have to think about the wildlife passing. You know, if the size is sufficient, then, then there is no problem. If the size is insufficient for the wildlife, then we have to increase the size. So we have to do it from, it, uh, from the very early stage. Uh, number three, because of the change in the size of the 12 structures, the cost implication is not so substantial. 
That means if we consider the requirements of online movement uh, in, at the design phase, the structures, the cost implication is not substantial. So the, the, from the you know study and the, from this assessment, it is a uh, good lesson that you know biodiversity is not uh, so expensive. But if we uh, handle it from the very beginning, uh, it is affordable, and we have to uh, allocate the amount for the biodiversity and for this study. Next slide, please. Yes, from our uh, experiences uh, in the context of Nepal, I have made some, uh, you know, uh, small SWOT assessment. Uh, if you see in the strength part, we have very good policy documents. Uh, we have wildlife friendly infrastructure construction guidelines. Uh, there is a dedicated department, you know, the Department of Forest, Department of, department of National Park and Wildlife Conservation. We have competent, competent technical manpower in the infrastructure development sector. We have strong support from the development partners. But at the, at the same time, there are equinoces also. Stakeholders are fully aware about the policy of the government. Uh, weak interagency coordination is the problem. And there is no integrated planning. Budget scarcity for the sophisticated design. No research and study about the outcome. There is a limited capacity of conducting biodiversity based assessment, critical habitat assessment, and smart green structures benefit assessment. Next slide, please. Yes, we have big opportunity, you know, to develop uh, wildlife friendly infrastructures because we are in the phase of the uh, big infrastructure development. We have opportunity to develop typical design suitable for different situations. Uh, we have very good opportunity to innovate the design using the local materials. Uh, we have a very good chance to preserve our natural habitat, and we have a chance to increase our capacity development and technology transfer. And there is a big you know, opportunity to, to foster economy through the fostering tourism and in, in, in attracting private sector investments. At the same time, there are a number of threats. Let me highlight a uh, few experts are available in the relevant field. Priority of people is quantity rather the conservation of the ecosystem. Less priority among the policymakers. Sometimes too expensive uh, and there is a budget deficit. There is no typical design in our hand. Still, there is a debate on optical, optimal length of wildlife crossing structures and their spacing. No trade of culture among the stakeholders. There is a, 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 you know, a sort of you know, uh, ego culture, no clear decision supporting tool, and managing uh, you know, intersection of the broad transportation and ecological corridors is a big challenge. Uh, next slide, please. Previous one, the recommendations and OFR, development of a decision support tool, the benefit from the ecosystem, Preservation cannot be compared with the money. However, they shall be appropriately addressed in the decision tool with a simple formula. What I mean is that you know there are a number of advantages while adopting the uh, you know green approach, natural fresh design. You know the, the you know the uh, drinking water, you know flood, you know safe, uh, you know the food, uh, you know the recreation facilities, aesthetic point. Yeah, these are the area advantage. Uh, but we have to, you know, uh, we have to make a tool to incorporate these areas and make a simple formula so that it is helpful to make a decision. Uh, and number two is the, the, the planning mitigation, the key factors, you know, what are the spacing of the wildlife structures? How far they have to given? You know, there are uh, different uh, guidelines about the size of the structures for different habitat species and the minimum, minimum recommended species are provided. But some of the experts have different opinion that even if the size and spacing are as per the most sophisticated guidelines, they may not be, be sufficient to provide complete ecological solution. Uh, this is the challenge. So, so based on the best practice, those guidelines will be explained appropriately. Next slide, please. Yes, so this is uh, this this graph uh, I like very much. Uh, you know, I, I refer this uh, graph from Kim Boni and the Theos Conservation Strategy Fund. Uh, actually, uh, we have to make a compromise between the continuous structures and the limited structures. Yeah, 
you know, if we make the continuous structure like flyover, underpass, overpass, over the, you know, the entire uh, forest structure, then the cost will be high. But, you know, there is the less, uh, you know, environmental effect. Uh, but if we, if we limit the length of the structure, the cost will be reduced and but the, the damage uh, score will be higher, okay? So we have to, uh, you know, compromise in between them. And, you know, this, is, this must be the optimal planning and the design solution. And for that, uh, there shall be a capacity building training to the planner and decision maker based on the adapted best practices. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, based on uh, our experience and, uh, uh, you know, based on the discussion in the above slides, uh, you know, my recommendation is that the developing world needs to be given financial resources for conserving the planet, natural capital. You know, those countries uh, might have policy have a commitment, but cannot implement it because of initial huge investment, although it might be not so costly in the long run. As biodiversity and ecosystem services in infrastructure development is a global agenda, the gap in funding faced by those countries should be supported. For this purpose, a special fund should be created and a procedure to select the project for which the gap finance could be supported from the special fund should be agreed. Uh, next up, yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience. Uh, that's the uh, end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dakar, for that excellent presentation and making a very strong case for the finance that is required. I mentioned myself that finance is very important. You have made that point that if biodiversity needs to be conserved, uh, there should be provision of providing additional funds. So we now move from Nepal to Fiji. And I would like to invite Mr. Kamal Gounder, the manager for the infrastructure sector. Uh, are you ready, Mr. Kamal? Yes, yes, Dr. Mathur. Okay, you, I just want to add that uh, uh, you are aware about the importance of upstream planning. And uh, you know that uh, climate and uh, biodiversity needs to be integrated. Uh, would like to know from you that how you are planning for this integration. Can you please in, uh, elaborate using examples? We are running short of time. I will request you to kindly stick to your time limits. Over to you, Mr. Kamal. Thank you, Dr. Amato. Can you see my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. And thank you all. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving this opportunity to present in this forum. So uh, basically, as uh, Dr. Mathur has said, uh, my presentation is basically in terms of on the upstream planning early in the infrastructure design processes, in terms of what Fiji is doing in terms of this integration and the role of regional planning. So in terms of the upstream planning from uh, Fiji side, as you all are aware that Fiji is located in the Pacific Islands, is one of our smaller, is one of the small island countries with a population less than $1 million. Uh, good transport infrastructure is key to healthy economic development. Infrastructure is also very plays an instrumental role in promoting economic growth, as well as in terms of alleviating poverty. Uh, Fiji's achievements have been driven by substantial and consistent public investments in infrastructure, public utilities, education, health, and social inclusion. And Fiji is also one of the hub of economic activity in the regional, in the Pacific Island. Pacific Island. Fiji is also emerged as a respected advocate on some of the great challenges facing humanity, including climate change, which Fiji is one of the uh, one of the top on the fighting for climate change issues as well as sustainable development. So in terms of uh, upstream planning, Fiji is guided through various documents. Uh, the one that I'm talking about is the Fiji's uh, National Development Plan, which has a vision of transforming Fiji, uh, which maps out the way forward for Fiji and all Fijians to realize our full potential as a nation. So we have a 20-year National Development Plan from 2017 to 2036 <coughs> and a comprehensive five-year development plan from 2017 to 2021, which has come to an end. Now we are reviewing this five-year development plan. Both these plans work together in terms of uh, bringing the agendas together. 
Uh, in terms of putting all the plans together, we also have a green growth framework for Fiji, which talks about the restoring the balance in development that is sustainable for our future. We have a five-year, 20-year national development plan, as I said. We have a national climate policy as well, which is guiding the upstream uh, development planning. We have a national adaptation plan as well, and also Fiji's NDC implementation roadmap from 2017 to 2030. The NDP, the National Development Plan is aligned with global commitments, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and consistent with the goals of Paris Agreement to achieve climate neutrality and a low emission world, which will develop a 2050 pathway to decarbonize the Fijian economy. Uh, this is also integrated into various cross-cutting issues, such as climate change, green growth, the environment, gender equity, disability, and governance, which is all mainstreamed into the NDP. Uh, we also, as I said, have a climate change policy, which guides all our projects and developments, which presents, presents a more detailed and deliberate articulation of Fiji's priorities in reducing present and future climate risk while maximizing our long-term gains in development. The climate change policy is a policy document that is defined by its foresight and evidence-based approach in reducing climate risk with the aim of addressing the specific climate vulnerabilities. Uh, moving forward, uh, we also have a green growth framework for Fiji as I, uh, as I discussed earlier, which is also guiding all our upstream planning and development, which uh, basically aims to restore the balance in development that is sustainable for our future. The word sustainable itself has been uh, Fiji's development agenda for a large part of the four decades since independence since, and similar to the rest of the world. The Green Growth Framework is an innovative tool to accelerate an integrated and inclusive sustainable development that inspires action at all levels in the country to build environmental resilience, build social improvement and reduce poverty, build economic growth and build resilience as well. A balance between the three pillars of the sustainable development that is economic, social and environment is the key for all our projects that we undertake. And this ensures that there is a balance between restored for all our projects and also for our future development that is both sustainable and can be sustained. And with Fiji remaining largely a pristine island country. Uh, in terms of the climate change issues in Fiji, we are faced with more frequent uh, tropical storms, increased rainfall, which is affect affecting our construction, the flooding issues, <coughs> the accelerated deterioration of infrastructure assets, the storm surges from tropical storms, the high temperatures and drought creating unwanted dust leading to health issues. So these are some of the climate change uh, from what we have been exper experiencing, basically from flooding, from uh, heavy rainfall. Uh, how is the, our country ensuring uh, this uh, in terms of the integration with all these policies? All the projects that are selected for financing, we ensure that that is based on the criteria such as it's aligned to the National Development Plan, it's alignment to the climate change policy. Uh, we look at the project ready, readiness side of things, and also in terms of presentations such as SDG and Paris agreements. Uh, we also have a public sector investment program guidelines, which is based on weighting, and also the projects are ranked as per economic viability, social, environment, climate change, mitigation, climate, and disaster resilience. As such, some of these issues that are faced on APA planning on the upper stream side are trying to avoid in terms of the, uh, in terms of avoid those issues rather than not uh, try to mitigate it later. So we have various projects in place, mainly funded through World Bank and IDB that uh, we, for example, the urban water supply and wastewater management project, the transport infrastructure investment project, which is about US $150 million project, which ensures that this integration is planned by undertaking various studies such as economic and social safeguard, social uh, in terms of the environmental safeguards and so on. Uh, I've also listed here in terms of our PSIP public sector investment weighting criteria that we, we use. And if you look at uh, things like on number four, number five, where we face, uh, where we put emphasis such as on social, which is looks at gender, poverty, disability, land and resettlement issues. Number five also is on the environmental climate change, uh, mitigation, climate and disaster resilience. So and so on. So this is where our priorities are and our projects are uh, weighted based on these criteria. 
in terms of also what we are also doing in terms of ensuring that uh, uh, that there is integration for upper stream planning. We are currently reviewing our design standards, uh, mainly for roads uh, and specifications to accommodate for sea level rise changes. We also have incorporated climate resilience measures into our construction contracts, mainly for road and water. Uh, we have uh, for bridges, we are raising our bridges and pavement levels. Uh, we have also changed the design for crossings, low level crossings to allow more than more thorough flow. Uh, we have more than about 4,000 crossings in Fiji, which are all low line. So we are now trying to uh, change the design to make it uh, more allow for more thorough flow. Plan, there's plans also for resilience routes to accommodate natural disasters from impacting social roads. Uh, we are also looking at alternative seawall designs. We are also looking at pavement construction techniques, also in terms of increase in minimum dimension for road drainage. Uh, let me also talk about a project that we're also in terms of the planning and at the uh, early stage of uh, uh, planning stage, which is a Nandi flood alleviation project. This is where our main international airport is. Uh, this is a river that we want to widen as well as drain. The river is about 65 kilometers in length. So usually this is uh, some of the photos back from 2012 and 2016 flooding that we experienced <coughs> in the Nandi town area. Uh, Nandi is uh, one of the, our highest income for, for tourism. That's where our most of the tourists come from. So when there's heavy rainfall and cyclones, the Nandi town entire gets flooded. So there's three, there's, uh, there are three projects around the Nandi flood elevation project. Uh, uh, we call it uh, in uh, project A, project B, project C. So we are trying to, uh, we are trying to work and combine the, all the projects uh, together so that there's coordination among all the projects. Uh, the project A is basically on the Nandi town surrounding dike and the inland drainage. Project B is the combination of structural measures such as widening, retarding basin, dike, uh, create, uh, construction of additional tributaries, and also in terms of uh, rainwater harvesting uh, underground tanks. And uh, the project C, which is watershed management on the upper stream side of things. Uh, basically, these are some of the maps from the integration maps from the flood level that we have been experiencing in the Tendi town. This is one of the options that we are looking at the design stage in terms of floodplain routing. Uh, floodplain routing uh, with the minimum of 50 meters and maximum of 500 uh, meters wide. So at this, this is at the early stage. We are also looking at option of widening of the river as well. Uh, these are some of the modeling that has come out. Uh, the current progress in terms of where we are with the project, the planning uh, system has a fundamental role to play into in the integrated infrastructure delivery. Currently, we are reviewing the design, which is the, done through the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, and they're financing the consultants for the review, as well as ENS studies are undergoing, ENS Environmental and Social Studies, which is looking at some of these design aspects, as well as environmental and social site as well. And we are also looking at the resettlement action plan as well. Uh, the last part of my presentation in terms of the role of regional planning in infrastructure development. Uh, the planning system has a fundamental role to play in integrated infrastructure delivery. Uh, regional planning also plays a very important and critical role in infrastructure planning. In Fiji, we have, uh, we have the infrastructure planning has been <coughs> hindered by complex multi-level governance arrangements uh, between the central government, the municipal council, as well as from the all the relevant utilities or statutory authorities like Fiji Roads, Water Authority, Telecom Fiji, as well as Energy Fiji Limited. Uh, the governance of infrastructure planning is extremely complex with multiple organizations, as I said, and Fiji's uh, planning for infrastructure is guided by the National Development Plan, which has a roadmap in it in itself and also through the uh, uh, project coordination and planning committee who looks after all the planning side of uh, projects, mainly all the infrastructure projects are discussed at one table, whereby if there's any cross-cutting issues, it's discussed uh, together. Uh, thank you very much. And that brings me to an end for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamal, for that excellent presentation on the upstream planning and how the integration is taking place in your country. Uh, I do understand we are running out of time. I need to move on to our fourth panelist, Mr. Planter. 
uh, you need to talk about and tell us uh, uh, the infrastructure development in the context of coastal areas, because that is where uh, we are keen, what kind of challenges you are facing and how you are addressing them. So over to you, Mr. Planter. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Uh, good, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my next slide will uh, uh, show what's uh, in store for us uh, for uh, uh, 15 minutes, uh, I guess. So the usual uh, preliminaries for context and uh, some initiatives uh, that we've been uh, uh, undertaking, uh, the government, uh, including NEDA, and uh, of course, the usual challenges and the way forward. Uh, the next slide uh, would... Uh, show that uh, our uh, country's development is threatened by our vulnerability to disasters, uh, climate change, and extreme uh, weather events. Uh, th thus, uh, green and uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, matters uh, to us. Uh, next slide uh, would show our efforts uh, in terms of uh, issuances or policy and regulatory environment to foster resiliency uh, and sustainability. These are all aimed at uh, addressing the development challenges and attaining our development agenda for a specific uh, development period. Okay, next slide. Uh, we're currently, NEDA and uh, the rest of government is currently in the thick of formulating the Philippine Development Plan for 2023 to 2028. Uh, this is due to be presented to the president and his cabinet by the middle of December. And we expect that uh, the Philippine Development Plan will be uh, approved by then and published uh, not, uh, by the end of the year. So for this uh, development plan uh, in our infrastructure uh, part of the plan, uh, we will highlight that uh, enabling uh, economic transformation should be founded on the delivery of sustainable, resilient, integrated, and modernized infrastructure services. Thus uh, showcasing that sustainability uh, is a... Uh, uh, a concern that uh, is uh, embedded in the development plan. Okay, next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, projects, development projects uh, that are uh, will be part of the Philippine development plan, uh, we are uh, cl classifying our current in initiative in terms of uh, the infrastructure uh, life cycle, uh, not just uh, initiatives of NEDA, but also the ag uh, agencies. So we have project planning uh, and development initiatives, so project appraisal and approval, procurement, implementation, construction, operation, and maintenance. So by no means, these, these are not compre comprehensive, and we are most likely uh, get uh, some insights from uh, conferences such as this uh, to refine our uh, processes. And uh, not only in planning, where we have a strong presence, the NEDA, in uh, item two, which is project appraisal uh, and approval. That's a, that is after the development plan is completed. And uh, the next slide is just uh, an advertisement. Uh, aid, uh, NETA has a strong mandate in planning, investment programming, monitoring, and evaluation. It's just a, a stone's throw away uh, from uh, ADB, and I need not elaborate this. But uh, what is uh, exciting uh, also part of our work will be the next slide, where our secretariat to the uh, investment Coordination Committee. This is an uh, interagency uh, coordination uh, committee uh, where the uh, major capital projects worth uh, 2.5 billion pesos are approved, uh, about, I think, 50,000 US dollars. So uh, before projects are approved for ODA, uh, for PPP, uh, the Secretariat undertakes technical review appraisal of all projects, not only infra, and have these uh, six uh, elements uh, to guide uh, the decision making. Uh, financial analysis, economic analysis, technical analysis, institutional analysis, environment analysis, and social analysis. Environmental analysis is uh, at least uh, uh, recently has uh, undergone uh, much changes in terms of methodologies. So we're seeing uh, ADB, uh, other development partners uh, incorporating uh, design measurements and uh, methodology improvements, and at some point, uh, it will inform also our processes. Uh, next slide, uh, we are also have, uh, we are rethinking our manual uh, in the appraisal of climate change and disaster risk reduction, uh, and this will be integrated also in the manner by which we will be appraising uh, the projects that will be submitted to us by the implementing uh, agencies. 
Now, the next slide. NEDA also has been uh, doing uh, its part uh, in this uh, master planning uh, business. Uh, we have this recently completed Manila-based sustainable development uh, master plan. We also have a uh, river ma uh, basin master planning courtesy of our uh, departments. Uh, this uh, uh, master planning documents inform the, uh, the projects uh, that will be uh, implemented by our agencies. Now, uh, next two slides uh, would show our uh, continuing uh, challenges and our journey uh, ahead. And uh, for this one, we classified again into uh, generic uh, four part institutional planning data and uh, operational concerns. So institutional, uh, uh, the need for uh, greater coordination and leadership, uh, and of course, uh, integration at the national government and sub-national uh, level. Uh, there's, uh, we're, we're building a case for the need for uh, master planning exercises, harmonizing it in, uh, uh, and uh, harmonizing it and incorporating green and sustainable sustainable principles, uh, data uh, constraints need to be addressed, and then uh, of course the resources and technical capacities not only of our implementing agencies but also of our other partners such as the subnational uh, levels. Now uh, opportunities, uh, uh, what uh, we're seeing is that. Uh, we need to, uh, a government needs to have this uh, consistent or, uh, uh, or comprehensive uh, review of uh, existing policies and uh, frameworks relating to green infra infrastructure, quality infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, and therefore uh, uh, technical uh, assistance is needed also in uh, seeing to it that our existing uh, guidelines and uh, standards are up, uh, updated and up to par to international uh, practices. Capacities I've mentioned earlier, but not only at the national level, uh, but also at the subnational uh, level and also uh, with a focus, of course, on climate resilient infrastructure uh, 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 projects. Uh, subnational and national uh, cooperation, uh, coordination, and then finally, uh, strengthening uh, monitoring and evaluation. I think that's the end of uh, my presentation. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Panta, for that excellent uh, update from what the country is doing. Uh, I do understand you have tight time commitments, but if you could stay on, it will be great. Uh, we can now move on to a quick Q&A session. If there are some questions in the chat box, may I request Karma if you could let me know if there is a question and to whom it is addressed. I think we have a question for Mr. Kamal. Um, at the moment, I don't see any question, Dr. Mathur. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and the question that I had posted, uh, Mr. Kamal has kindly already responded to it. Oh, but great. But maybe if I could then uh, also ask this question to our um, Mr. Planta uh, about, uh, you know, the you mentioned about all these uh, plans and the, the infrastructure, uh, you know, the various steps in the project. But I was wondering if there is any uh, sort of strategic level assessment or strategic environmental assessment. As we were speaking earlier, that's quite an important um, step for these high level strategic level planning. So I was wondering if there is any strategic environmental assessment or something similar that takes place for infrastructure in the Philippines. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you for that question. Uh, well, I conveniently not include uh, excluded it there. Uh, basically, because uh, con the conversation is still happening, uh, we understand what it means. Uh, but uh, at some point, uh, our Department of Na Environment and Natural Resources would have to have uh, uh, released uh, such uh, more detailed guidelines. Right now, we're, uh, of course, the useful. Uh, we're hearing uh, practices from the uh, the Netherlands, from the Japanese sites, and. Uh, of course, uh, when you deal with so, so many development partners, they have so, some sort of uh, uh, inclination how to uh, uh, what is to uh, uh, 
well, depends on the context. It's uh, the articulation of the SEA. We know what needs to be done, but uh, at some point, uh, a country-based uh, SEA uh, protocols and processes need to be issued. At, the, at least that's our uh, that thinking. And right now, we're still in the thick of the conversation. But uh, of course, at some point, it will not. So uh, what's happening is technically, it's uh, embedded in the processes uh, in the feasibility studies in the master planning exercises. But uh, as a formal uh, policy, uh, huh, uh, we would probably love a uh, clear issue once so that we can technically show what we've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Planter, for that response. Uh, if there are no questions, we have heard our four panelists and uh, uh, we Sorry, Dr. Matu, there is one question in the Q&A box. Okay. Can you um, read that out and address to whom? Uh, uh, I think it's for Mr. Dakal. How do you get contractors to do the work on reinstatement properly, as it is always at the end of a project, but for wildlife, it is critically important? So it's basically, uh, I guess, the post-construction measures after completing the construction. Did you sir, Sushil, sir? Yeah, yeah I think yeah. Uh, the questions have been raised uh, because I have uh, explained about the Naranhar Button Road and it is under the construction phase. So this question might have been there. Yeah, I, I agree with him. You know, uh, the issues shall be, you know, endorsed and incorporated during the design and planning phase. But for this particular, uh, you know, project, uh, you know, uh, in the environment assessment report, it was mentioned that the separate wildlife study shall be carried out. And based on this recommendation, uh, at the start of the uh, you know, project, uh, you know, uh, the uh, baseline diversity assessment has been made and the recommendation by the, this uh, assessment has been incorporated in the, in the design, even during the construction phases. So there is no uh, you know, big, uh, you know, difficulty in this particular uh, contact. But uh, what we learned from, from this, uh, you know, uh, project experience is there, we have to handle this issue at the beginning, beginning that is at the uh, planning phase, uh, at, the, at the initial uh, project cycle phase. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dakal. Uh, we now move into the last part, which is the takeaways. Uh, Mr. Kamal has already explained in detail, but uh, one more minute for you, Mr. Kamal, if you want to come up and say some take home messages for our audience, what would you like to give? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. <coughs> <coughs> Basically, in terms of the takeaway message from Fiji, I think in terms of the upstream planning, uh, we for Fiji, we have all very, in terms of our policies that are guiding it, mainly the Fiji National Development Plan, as well as the Green Growth Framework. And also now Fiji is one of the first in the world to have a Climate Change Act also in place, which guides all our now projects and uh, projects for future development in terms of ensuring that all projects uh, does carry out a proper ENS surveys and also looks at various issues before we move into the construction or detailed design stage. Uh, I think you had presented that in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Ka, I think uh, you had talked about in terms of green infrastructure and all that. So basically looking at those options as well. So that's number one. And number two, in terms of the planning, I think that's very critical for all the projects to be in line with the country's uh, policies, country's plans, and also in terms of the climate change uh, policies and the targets that are set out. So that's very important. And also project readiness is very important. So I think those are some of the key yeah. takeaway points from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have taken our notes. We will circulate them also in the end. Mr. Dakal, any takeaway from you at this point? Okay. Uh, let me share the. Uh, let me share my presentation, or I have to speak only. You can just speak. You can just speak okay. if you want. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Uh, Dr. Mathur. 
yeah uh, from our experiences and from from uh, the you know initiatives taken in nepal uh, we have some messages and takeaways uh, from nepal nepal like many countries uh, in the developing south considers infrastructure development as its top priority uh, at the same time nepal is fully committed to conserve its uh, unique biodiversity and array of ecosystem services they provide most of the linear infrastructure in Nepal has to be aligned along the east-west axis within the mid-hill Tarai uh, plains and is required to pass through the numerous forest passages, the national parks, protected areas, and therefore greening the infrastructure development is necessary and important. Nepal has prepared its implementing wildlife-friendly infrastructure policy uh, guidelines as a part of the directives. Uh, it is endorsed by the government of Nepal in 2022. It is recently endorsed. And Nepal is experiencing acute financial constraints in some projects as cost of the building wildlife friendly structure like uh, flyover uh, underpasses is uh, expensive and very high. The cost is very high. Uh, there, there has to be a good trade off between the net present value and socio-environment damage score while designing wildlife friendly infrastructure measures. Uh, this is the message and Nepal wants to seek adequate financial support rather than compromise on the construction of wildlife friendly infrastructures. Uh, finally, Nepal considers investment in green infrastructure as a tool for sustainable development as it, is, uh, it will protect natural habitat, conserve ecosystems, coastal tourism, uh, attract uh, private investment and ultimately uh, foster the national economy. Uh, these are the takeaways from the pal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dakal. Your words are music to our ears when you say that uh, investment in infrastructure can also lead to conservation of biological diversity. May I now request uh, uh, Mr. Planta if you can come in for a minute? Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Matur. I guess for now, my uh, uh, main takeaway is uh, we should uh, keep this conversation going. Uh, okay. uh, we think we know what we know, but uh, uh, looking at the presentations, I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, insights there that uh, uh, my teammates in uh, the Philippine government would benefit from. So uh, even us uh, as a group uh, in government, have to find ways to sort of uh, get our acts together and uh, look at this uh, whole of government approach in uh, dealing with uh, green infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, or quality infrastructure. Again, uh, wrapping our heads around uh, making a dent, at least uh, for the next uh, six years, uh, which coincides with our development plan. Thank you, Dr. Matu. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mukopade, one last minute for you. What do you want yes. to say to our audience, although you have already provided a lot of details? Uh, sir, my, my message is that this is my submission, that we have a huge uh, target, we have a huge mandate. So finance definitely is very, very crucial for our country. But simultaneously, that is the more and most important crucial is the expertise. Because if you find when anybody, even the ADB, World Bank, whatever the organization, including our statutory organization, the officers or experts dealing with the forest have little knowledge about the other environmental protection. So that's why whenever that is whatever I, I am adjoining with the comma, Madam has spoken after monitoring purpose. That is how the compliance is going on. Though we have a very dedicated system that is inbuilt with the present contractor as for the award, even though as a OM contractor, so there is system, but there is a lack of expertise, lack of knowledge, because when there is a huge mandate, so simultaneously more than 200 projects is going on. So at least 200, 100 or 50 experts in India should be there who has a holistically knowledge about air pollution simultaneously with the wildlife, simultaneously with the forest cover, simultaneously with the forest uh, water body like Chilka. So this type of expert is very, very rare in our country. So it is, okay. we are a huge struggling with the experts regarding this. So uh, my submission with the ADB, whether 
this kind of expert including the any financial mechanism as if our ministry desired with the honorable uh, minister so definitely there is a huge scope because already we have able to construct 11000 km under bharat mala till we have to construct within 3 years around 55000 km of bharat mala project including 200 ropeways so monetary is a very very serious issue okay. for us thank you thank you mr mukhopadhyay trixi can you put my two slides trixi okay sir i'm um, sorry let me check with jinky one moment i just picked up uh, points from uh, our colleagues uh, what the takeaways can be we are almost coming to an end uh, of our session if you can put uh, those two slides i sent to karma are they there just a moment please so as i said uh, we would be combining all the learnings from this workshop along with the three other workshop which were held and details were provided by karma so 3 plus 1 4 we would uh, combine them all together and as uh, sujata said that we are planning to hold a side event in the big cbd cop meeting uh, in in montreal uh, we would be presenting that so uh, very quickly can you put it on slide mode ha okay can you move to the next one so see this is what we heard from nepal nepal presented uh, an assessment of the net present value they have prepared a matrix which is a very good way of looking at it that how do you look at the present value and you then factor it out with the socio environmental damage and then take a call on what kind of planning or wildlife infra friendly infrastructure measures could be there and we heard uh, the details from uh, dr mukhopadhyay that environmental safeguards in form of carbon sinks through green belts rainwater harvesting wildlife crossing structures of all kinds and most importantly those of you who deal with the coal sector utilization of fly ash as a highway construction material so these are some of the things of good practices which countries can look into as we look at the mission of green india green infrastructure development and as uh, our colleague from fiji explained that upstream planning and regional planning are absolutely critical for ensuring sustainable infrastructure development over there next one please and then finally what i need to say is that uh, we are talking of uh, conservation of natural capital but this conservation cannot take place till we mainstream infrastructure development and that is what we are arguing in the cbd that uh, in the cbd post uh, 2020 framework there should be a specific mention of mainstreaming of infrastructure developments and as international negotiations go we will try to feed this in that and then all our planners and our presenters talked about evidence based because where the corridors are to be located where uh, whether they are being used or not what should be the size what should be the shape what should be the height so what is important is that the dialogue between the wildlife biologists and transportation planners needs to go along and also along with that uh, a period what dr makupadhyay mentioned of rigorous monitoring and then uh, this issue of cost and i refer to my colleague mr dakal who has been maintaining and mentioning about the increased cost uh our feeling is that the wildlife mitigation cost should be embedded in the project cost itself because why they should be treated separately and wherever you do that if you want to raise uh, 1 million for construction you can also raise 1.2 million for mitigation so these should be as far as possible tried as a mitigation combined mitigation cost and then we need efficiency in design in development and delivery because uh cost overruns also time overruns also cost money so all these three d's are important good design proper development efficient delivery and then we need uh, the competence of biologists and managers together 
and coordination with local authorities. So these are the kind of combos that we need to look at. There is no simple recipe for green infrastructure development. We need to continue to have reforms in both policies and practices. Because somewhere as we knew what Nepal is doing, what Fiji is doing, what Philippines is doing, these are all very good practices of integration of these developments into the national development plans. And that is what as countries will revise their NBSAPs, here is an opportunity to ensure that the infrastructure development is sustainable and corridors and connectivities are well maintained. So my last slide, I think, is a thank you slide. And that is what I want to thank all our presenters, all our resource persons, our panelists, and above all the audience, which has stayed for two years to us. And of course, my great team at the IDB headquarters, led by Karma, and of course, today morning by Sujata. So thank you very much. And uh, I can assure you that uh, all these learnings that we have made uh, through these four webinars, we will combine them up and these will be made available very soon on uh, the ADB and other websites so that people who have missed out and who want to know the details can get back to you. With these words, uh, I thank you once again and I uh, would like to close this session now. Thank you. Unless you have some last words, Karma, from you. Uh, none from me, Dr. Mathur. Just thank you very much to everybody. Uh, so I would like to thank your team, which has done some excellent job. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Bye-bye. So, ADV, all the Karma and all the speakers, as well as audience. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. all. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.